So right all set? Yes. Okay. Well, good evening everybody. Welcome to this evening episode of Pursue. And this is Pursue 13A and we're starting with pathology of the head and neck. We are live from Ames, New Delhi via Kolkata. And a very, very interesting topic, sinonasal neoplasm. But put it up in a different way, horses, zebras and unicorns. So let's see what are these horses, zebras and unicorn. And to talk on that, we have a very special, very talented person, Dr. Anchal Kakkar. She, presently, she is an assistant professor in the Department of Pathology, Ames, New Delhi. Earlier, she was an assistant professor in the Department of Pathology of Tata Memorial Hospital, Mumbai. She did her MD Pathology from Ames, New Delhi, the senior residency there, followed by a senior resident associateship at Ames, New Delhi. Her research interest has been head and neck pathology and pediatric pathology, with more than 125 publications, national and international, with citations in WHO fascicles, 10 book chapters, She's also a contributor in the famous pathology basis of disease, the Robbins, I think which all of us must have read. Multiple awards including the Dr. N. C. Nayak Award for the Talented Young Pathologist by IAPM Delhi Chapter in 2016. Before I ask Dr. Kakkar to take over, let me request all of you to please keep your mic muted, your camera off and at no point please don't share your screen with this. Let us see the horses, the zebras, and the unicorns. Ma'am, please take over and let's start. Good evening. Uh, at the outset, I'd like to thank the organizers for giving me the opportunity to take this lecture. I think over the last one year, residents are the ones who have suffered the most because uh, they haven't been getting the number of cases that usually come in and they have really lost out on seeing the cases during the res their residency. So hopefully I can showcase a few sinonasal neoplasms and uh, give some perspective on these tumors which are quite difficult to diagnose sometimes. Uh, most of the images in this presentation are from our own cases. However, there are some from articles and resources on the internet. Um, as far as textbooks go, uh, these are some of the books that residents should uh, definitely look into to get an idea about sinonasal neoplasms. So to start off, the sinonasal tract is a complex anatomic area which uh, it encompasses the nasal cavity and the paranasal sinuses including the maxillary, the ethmoid, the frontal and the sphenoid sinuses. The nasal cavity is lined by the pseudostratified ciliated columnar respiratory epithelium, which is known as the Schneiderian mucosa, which is composed of basal cells, goblet cells, and predominantly ciliated columnar cells. Under the epithelium, you have the lamina propria, uh, which contains mucoserous glands, and then the submucosa, which contains branch tubular alveolar submucoserous glands. The olfactory mucosa is a specialized sensory ep epithelium which com is composed of olfactory neural cells and lax goblet cells and it is seen in the roof of the nasal cavity in the region of the cribriform plate of the ethmoid. The mucosa in the paranasal sinuses is similar but it is thinner, less vascular and contains fewer mucoserous glands. Uh, the WHO classification of sinonasal tumors, at present we have the fourth edition and it from the third edition, the third, fourth underwent a complete overhaul where the number of entities were reduced, a few new entities were included and a few emerging entities were uh, included as provisional diagnoses which are most likely to make it to the fifth edition which will be coming out soon. Uh, so the sinonasal tract gives rise to a very diverse array of neoplasms including epithelial tumors like papillomas, carcinomas, neuroectodermal tumors including olfactory neuroblastoma, melanoma, ewing sarcoma, mesenchymal tumors like rhabdomyosarcoma, biphenotypic sinonasal sarcoma which is typical to this location, solitary fibrous tumor among others, hematopoietic neoplasms and also we have neoplasm which may extend from adjacent structures such as pituitary adenomas and meningiomas. Now, among these tumors, many of them have a very similar appearance on itchy sections. That is, they appear basaloid or small round blue cell tumors, which are characterized by a monotonous proliferation of cells with scant cytoplasm and relatively small nucleosides. So, these tumors need detailed immunohistochemical evaluation with or without molecular testing to arrive at the diagnosis, which is directed by histomorphological features, which are subtle but need to be picked up. 
So this is the classification of WHO 2017, which is what we follow currently. And uh, looking at that, we'll start with our workhorse diagnosis, which we see most frequently. Uh, coming to the benign tumors, we have sinonasal papillomas, which arise from the sinonasal mucosa. They more frequently arise from the lateral nasal wall and extend into the paranasal sinuses, with only the exophytic type of papillomas arising from the nasal septum. The inverted and oncocytic papillomas are seen in uh, uh, older adults from 40 years onwards, whereas the exophytic type are seen in younger patients. The inverted and exophytic papillomas are more frequent in males and they are associated with a uh, human papilloma virus, while the oncocytic type does not have any such association. Uh, the inverted papillomas have the highest risk of transformation to, malignan uh, to malignancy, while exophytic types have the least. Inverted papillomas are, uh, show endophytic growths of non keratinizing squamous epithelium, which is about 5 to 30 cells thick. It has a very nice basement membrane surrounding the tumor cells, which show maintained pol uh, polarity and minimal nuclear pleomorphism. The squamous cells may contain abundant glycogen, giving it a clear appearance, and surface keratinization may be present. Along with the squamous cells, we have interspersed columnar cells and mucocytes, and intraepithelial mu mucous cysts may be seen. A characteristic feature is transmigrating neutrophils and mitosis are rare being seen only in the basal or parabasal layers. Here in this figure you can see that the papilloma is, has an endophytic growth, is composed predominantly of squamous cells with transmigrating neutrophils and a few mucous cells being present. Uh, in this figure you can see that ma majority of the cells are showing clearing of cytoplasm due to the presence of glycogen. Oncocytic papillomas show exophytic and endophytic growth and as is obvious from their name, they are composed of columnar cells with abundant granular eosinophilic cytoplasm which is usually not as thick as an inverted papilloma being only 2 to 5 layers thick. The nuclei may be vesicular to hyperchromatic and these, uh, these, uh, uh, the tumor cells have cilia on their surface. They may show a tram track appearance with the nuclei being arranged parallelly to the basement membrane in two layers. Intraepithelial microcysts are frequent as are seen here and these contain neutrophils and mucus. Exophytic papill papillomas are extremely rare and these are composed of papillary forms with del uh, fronds with delicate fibrovascular cores which are lined by multi-layered squamous epithelium 5 to 20 cells thick. It contains squamous cells along with few respiratory cells and only occasional mucocytes. Inflammatory cells are usually not seen. Surface keratinization is not seen in this tumor and uh, at this point I'd like to highlight the differential diagnosis of a keratinizing cutaneous squamous cell papilloma which arises in the nasal vestibule close to the septum but it shows extensive keratinization on the surface and it has prominent hypergranulosis and may show the presence of coilocytes. It lacks ciliated cells and mucocytes which is how you differentiate between the two. Trans uh, Papillomas can undergo malignant transformation from dysplasia to carcinoma in situ and even invasive carcinoma which may be non-keratinizing or keratinizing. And evidence of uh, malignant transformation may be seen in the uh, form of disorganization of uh, the cells and loss of polarity, presence of paradoxical squamous maturation, decrease in transmigrating neutrophils which are uh, very few in number here, increase in mitosis, desmoplastic stroma, bone invasion, increased ki 67 labeling index, especially above the basal, layer, basal and parabasal layers, and increased P53 expression. Uh, often malignant transformation of papillomas does not show overt uh, stromal invasion and it may be uh, called dysplasia in a papilloma. However, the presence of desmoplastic stroma is something that would help us to go towards a carcinoma in these cases. Coming to the carcinomas, these represent fewer than 5% of all head and neck tumors. They are diagnosed primarily on the basis of morphology and immunohistochemistry. And those carcinomas which lack morphological or immunohistochemical evidence of specific lineage differentiation are classified as sinonasal undifferentiated carcinomas or SNUC, which is a favorite diagnosis for a lot of pathologists. However, improving molecular techniques in recent years have led to more specific characterization of sinonasal carcinomas with many poorly differentiated tumors which were previously called SNUC being redefined into more specific characteristic categories based on their molecular characteristics. So first we come to the most common neoplasm which is squamous cell carcinoma. It is the most common histological type accounting for 80-85% to 85 of cases. 
Majority of patients are in the 6 to 7 decades of life and it has shows the male preponderance. These tumors most frequently occur in the maxillary antrum followed by the nasal cavity and the ethmoid sinus. Uh, histologically, they are classified as keratinizing and non-keratinizing or partially keratinizing squamous cell carcinomas. And these two types have different etiological factors, with keratinizing squamous cell carcinoma being associated with tobacco uh, usage as well as wood exposure to wood dust, leather dust, textile dust. And uh, it may also occur in the setting of malignant transformation of sinonasal papillomas. Whereas non-keratinizing um, squamous cell carcinoma has been shown to have an association with high-risk human papilloma virus. Uh, there are rarer subtypes like spindle cell squamous cell carcinoma and lymphoepithelial squamous cell carcinoma as well. Coming to keratinizing squamous cell carcinoma, this is a malignant epithelial neoplasm with squamous differentiation which the differentiation which arises from the surface epithelium. It is composed of cohesive irregular uh, nest cords or isolated cells which have eosinophilic cytoplasm and it shows the uh, evidence of uh, squamous differentiation in the form of individual cell keratinization or with the formation of squamous pearls as well as intercellular bridges as seen here. The tumor cells are surrounded by a desmoplastic stroma which may show a prominent inflammatory infiltrate. And dysplasia is present in the overlying epithelium. These tumors are graded as well moderately or poorly differentiated based on the extent of keratinization and their outcome is based on the tumor stage. Also nasal cavity tumors do better than maxillary sinus tumors. So here you can see these are well differentiated squamous, this is a well differentiated squamous cell carcinoma with my good number of keratin pearls being formed whereas this is moderately differentiated, only occasional pearls, however the cytoplasm does show evidence of intracytoplasmic keratinization and then you have a poorly differentiated squamous cell carcinoma where you would want to do immunohistochemistry with, uh, uh, with squamous markers as the tumor cells are quite discohesive and you would want some supportive evidence to call this a squamous uh, neoplasm. Uh, next, we come to non-keratinizing squamous cell carcinoma. These tumors are characterized by a distinctive ribbon-like growth pattern and absent to limited squamous maturation. And these account for only about 10 to 20% of sinonasal squamous cell carcinomas. They may, ha may have endophytic, papillary or exophytic growth. And they show broad anastomosing bands of tumor cells and rounded nests as well. And they have a very smooth stromal interface with pushing borders. The tumor cells are ovoid to elongated and are arranged perpendicularly. Here you can see that this, there's an appearance of peripheral palisading because of this. And the tumor cells are primitive appearing because keratinization is absent or only very focal. Uh, these tumors, as I mentioned, are often interpreted as dysplasia in an inverted papilloma because of these features. However, they do have frequent mitosis, nuclear premorphism, and necrosis. Immunohistochemically, they are positive for epithelial markers like cytokeratin and for squamous markers like CK56, which is a high molecular weight cytokeratin, P63, and P40. And about 30 to 50 percent of these tumors have been found to harbor transcriptionally active high risk HPV, and these stain positively with P16. So these images show you the nice peripheral palisading of these tumor cells which appear quite undifferentiated but here you can see that they have brisk mitotic activity and considerable nuclear pleomorphism which would help to differentiate from a papilloma. The outcome of squamous cell carcinoma is quite poor with uh, about 65% of five year survival rate for nasal cavity carcinomas and it's much worse for maxillary sinus carcinomas as I mentioned. These tumors have frequent local recurrences and lymph node metastasis in around 15%. However, the presence of high-risk HPV has been found to be associated with improved survival. But this again is based on date on Western literature and we really don't know uh, what the status is in our country. Now we come to some of the more exotic horses. Uh, we do this in on a case basis. So this is case one, which was a 66-year-old male with a left sinonasal mass who underwent a biopsy followed by an excision. The tumor intraoperatively was present in the nasal cavity, the ethmoids and the maxillary sinus, so quite an invasive tumor. So here you can see a tumor with nice papillary architecture where you have finger-like papillae with hierarchical branching. At places a tubular glandular pattern can be appreciated, whereas in other areas it's more solid appearing with fused glands. And on higher magnification, you can see that these uh, glandular structures are lined by tall columnar cells with crowding and pseudostratification of the nuclei. A number of goblet cells are um, seen uh, interspersed between the columnar cells and these stained uh, blue on AB pass staining showing that they contain mucin. 
another high magnification and we can see that these nuclei are cigar, cigar shaped or pencilate quite reminiscent of colon carcinoma there are frequent mitotic figures and on immunohistochemistry you can see that the tumor is immunonegative for cytokeratin 7 whereas it's positive for ck20 and cdx2 so with these features the diagnosis is intestinal type adenocarcinoma or itac now, sinonasal adenocarcinomas are a very heterogeneous group, accounting for about 8 to 20 percent of sinonasal malignant tumors, and intestinal type adenocarcinomas resemble intestinal adenocarcinomas, hence their name. They are associated with exposure to wood, leather, textile dust, and as well as formaldehyde. However, they also occur sporadically. They are most commonly seen in the fifth to seven decades of life and are predominantly seen in men. The ethmoid sinus is the most common site, followed by nasal cavity and maxillary sinus. However, sporadically occurring intestinal type adenocarcinomas most frequently arise in the maxillary antrum. These are exophytic masses and they have uh, extensive infiltration into surrounding tissue. A multiple multitude of growth patterns may be seen, papillary, tubular, solid, mucinous and mixed. And these tumors develop through intestinal metaplasia of the surface epithelium. They can be graded as low, intermediate and high grade. Low grade tumors have long slender papillae which are lined by a single layer of columnar cells with maintained polarity, not much crowding. And they have minimal nuclear pleomorphism. However, intermediate grade tumors show more cellular crowding and pseudostratification. Mitotic activity is uh, more than in low grade tumors. And high grade tumors have more of solid growth pattern with fused glands, presence of necrosis, frank invasion into surrounding structures. There's more nuclear pleomorphism, loss of polarity, and brisk mitotic activity. These tumors may be composed predominantly of signet ring cells and goblet cells as well. Uh, as they resemble intestinal type adenocarcin uh, intestinal adenocarcinomas, they also immunophenotypically resemble them, being positive for CK20, CDX2, MUC2, SATB2, and VILIN. They are variably CK7 positive and they may show focal positivity for neuroendocrine markers like synaptophysin. KRAS mutations have been identified in up to 40% of these tumors. Uh, they need to be differentiated from metastatic colorectal adenocarcinomas, which would be a very rare occurrence and you would need the relevant clinical history. Uh, or the most important differential diagnosis is non-intestinal type adenocarcinomas, which are CK7 positive and negative for CK20 and also the cytomorphology is different from these tumors. So lively gland neoplasms also do occur in this in the sinonasal region. However, most of them have characteristic histological features and are cytokeratin-negative for CK20. ITACs are potentially aggressive lethal tumors with frequent local recurrence, lymph node metastasis and distant, met and distant metastasis. Tumor stage is the most important prognostic factor and solid mucinous and signet ring patterns are associated with the worst outcome. The next case is of a 37-year-old male who presented with nasal obstruction and uh, here you can see again we have a tumor with papillary glandular architecture. There are areas of necrosis and hemorrhage. You can see these glandular structures here which are lined by cells which appear a little different from the previous tumor. Here you can see that the cells are cuboidal to columnar with the banded eosinophilic cytoplasm. The nuclei are more basally located. They are round in, uh, as opposed to being cigar shaped. And there's brisk mitotic activity here. This tumor was immunopositive for CK7 and negative for CK20 and CDX2 and also should retain INI1 expression. This was a non-intestinal type adenocarcinoma and it is a, a defined as a sinonasal adenocarcinoma that does not show the features of a salivary gland neoplasm and does not have an intestinal phenotype. These are idiopathic surface mucosal derived tumors, again seen over a wide age range with male preponderance, again being frequently uh, seen in the nasal cavity and ethmoid sinuses. However, high grade tumors are more frequent in the maxillary sinus. And these patients present with facial deformity and proptosis due to the extensive invasion of these tumors. Uh, we see submucosal glandular or papillary growth. As I mentioned, they are lined by single layer of non ciliated cuboidal to columnar cells, which have eosinophilic to clear to oncocytic uh, cytoplasm as seen here. The nuclei round and stratification is usually not very evident. Intraluminal mucin may be present as may mucocytes. Low-grade tumors show mild to moderate pleomorphism and occasional mitosis. Necrosis is usually not seen. However, high-grade tumors show sheet-like growth, moderate to marked pleomorphism, increased mitotic activity, necrosis, and bone invasion.
These tumors are positive for cytokeratin, CK7, but they are negative for CK20, CDX2, and myothelial markers, which distinguish from ITACs and salivary gland neoplasms. Uh, the treatment of choice is surgical excision with or without radiation. Low-grade tumors have an excellent prognosis. However, they do have recurrences. But lymph node and, and distal metastasis do not occur. However, high-grade tumors have a dismal prognosis with frequent metastasis. The next case is a 76-year-old female who presented with facial pain and swelling and ptosis. And she had a swelling over the left cheek as well as ulceration of the palate. So here in the excision specimen, you can see there's palatal mucosa with the underlying bone of the hard palate and there is a tumor infiltrating bone. On the other side, you can see that the maxillary sinus mucosa is here. It's intact and there's a submucosal tumor. I'm sure many, many of you have already guessed what this is. It had cribriform patterns, solid pattern and at place the tumor cells were arranged in irregularly infiltrating cords as well as tubules. In the cribriform areas, there were punched out spaces containing mucoid material and uh, the tubular areas showed true tubule formation with where you can see that, that there is an, uh, an irregular luminal uh, surface and two types of cells here. The outer abluminal cells appear darker while the inner luminal cells appear slightly pale in comparison. These are true lumina. And these are the solid areas where you can see that the tumor cells have scant cytoplasm. They have angulated hyperchromatic nuclei. Perineural invasion was very frequent in this tumor. On immunohistochemistry, CD117 highlighted the luminal cells while P40 stained the abluminal cells. And we performed MIB break apart fish. And here you can see that this is the intact MIB uh, gene. Whereas here there is a rearrangement leading to a break a part of the signals into one red and one green signal. So this was a case of adenoid cystic carcinoma, which is the most common minor salivary gland tumor. It is seen in the four to six decades of life and there is a slight female preponderance. The palate is the most common site in the oral cavity and the maxilla in the sinonasal region. Most patients present with a slow growing mass which may ultimately uh, is ulcerate the overlying mucosa. It is an invasive tumor which has myoepithelial as well as ductal differentiation and it is composed predominantly of basaloid cells which have a basal or myoepithelial phenotype with a very small proportion of ductal epithelial cells. These basaloid cells are small with scanty eosinophilic to clear cytoplasm, angulated nuclei and I, as I showed you, you have cribriform, tubular and solid growth patterns. The abluminal cells, they express cytokeratin, smooth muscle lactin, P63, P40 and calponin, while the interspersed ductal cells strong, are strongly positive for cytokeratin, CK7 and CD117, also EMA and CEA. This tumor is characterized by, by a fusion of the MIB or MIB-L1 oncogene with the transcription factor gene NFIB, which is seen in about 80% of cases. And also, more importantly, this fusion pro uh, can be detected by immunohistochemistry for the fusion protein MYB, which can be done fairly simply in routine diagnostic practice. The differential diagnosis includes other uh, salivary gland neoplasms like pleomorphic adenoma and polymorphous adenocarcinoma and a combination of uh, um, immunohistochemical markers like uh, CD117, SMA and MIB and the uh, PLAG1 can help us to make the differential diagnosis with MIB being specific for this tumor. Uh, the gene rearrangement can be detected by fluorescence in situ hybridization, by sequencing, by real-time PCR or as I mentioned by immunohistochemistry with the abluminal cells staining, staining more strongly than the luminal cells. Histological grade is the most important predictor of outcome in these tumors and it is determined by the proportion of the various growth patterns with the solid component being associated with larger tumor size, frequent recurrence and worse outcome. So this is why we need to report what is the predominant growth pattern and if any solid component is present, we need to give a rough estimate of the percentage of the tumor that shows solid component. And we can give a comment regarding the high propensity for lymph node involvement in these cases which have an increased solid component. Uh, although this tumor is generally indolent, the long-term prognosis is poor with 5-year survival of around 60-75% to 75 and you have frequent local recurrences and late onset metastasis have also been described. Occasionally, it may undergo a high-grade transformation, which confers a high propensity for lymph node metastasis. 
An important differential diagnosis is the newly described entity HPV related multiphenotypic cyanonasal carcinoma which has a histopathological appearance which is similar to that of adenoid cystic carcinoma particularly the solid pattern. Uh, this tumor also displays multiple lineages of differentiation that is myoepithelial and ductal like adenoid cystic carcinoma but in addition it also displays squamous differentiation and may have a sarcomatoid appearance. Uh, squamous differentiation is also evidenced in the presence of dysplasia in the overlying epithelium which suggests a surface epithelial origin and not from the submucosal seromucinous glands from where adenoid cystic carcinoma arises. This tumor does not show the presence of MEP gene fusion but it is associated with high risk HPV type 33 on mRNA in situ hybridization and it stains positive for P16. In comparison to adenoid cystic carcinoma, this tumor has an indolent clinical course with local recurrences but no lymph node metastasis which is why it is important to distinguish between the two. Uh, importantly, adenoid cystic carcinoma can also show P16 positivity so we need to perform mRNA-ish to distinguish between these two tumors. Uh, so these are the, uh, the histological features and you will see that although it does predominantly show a uh, solid appearance, it does frequently show the cribriform and tubular patterns as well and it looks almost identical to adenoid cystic carcinoma and this is P16 positivity which is diffuse but more importantly as I mentioned we need to perform mRNA in situ hybridization to detect transcriptionally active HPV and make this diagnosis. So let's come on to the zebras. You can see that they all look quite uh, similar to each other. It's quite difficult to pick one out and that's what we have here a uh, number of undifferentiated appearing tumors which resemble each other considerably on HNE and added to that biopsies from the sinonasal region are frequently ulcerated they show crushing of tumor cells and necrosis and you have very little viable tumor on which you can actually work up the case and make a diagnosis so we need to have a systematic approach to go, through, uh, go over these and come to a diagnosis uh, Dr. Lester Thompson has given a mnemonic which is Mr. Sleep to cover all of the tumors that have this appearance and I'd like to add to it and make it Mr. Sleep is nuts. So let's see what tumors come into the differential diagnosis of small blue cell tumors of the sinonasal region. So for M we have mucosal melanoma, R is for abdomyosarcoma, then lots of S in sleep. We have squamous cell carcinoma non-keratinizing which looks basaloid. Then you have small cell neuroendocrine carcinoma, solid adenoid cystic carcinoma and along with it HPV related multiphenotypic carcinoma, sinonasal undifferentiated carcinoma or SNAC, SMARC B1 deficient carcinoma, SMARC A4 deficient carcinoma, quite a mouthful and then you have L for lymphoma, E for esthesioneuroblastoma, Ewing sarcoma which also includes the recently described adamantinoma like Ewing sarcoma and then you have P for pituitary adenoma and NUTS is for nut carcinoma. So let's look at some of these cases. Let's see whether we can actually make a diagnosis. How easy is it or is it really difficult? Okay, we'll start with the one which might be the most easy to identify, olfactory neuroblastoma. This is a rare neuroectodermal neoplasm which demonstrates neuroblastic differentiation. It is uh, characteristically seen in the region of the cribriform plate of ethmoid. It has a wide age, ra age range with peaks in the 5th, 5th and 6th decades and in the 2nd decade of life, more frequently seen in males. Radiologically, frequently you see a dumbbell shaped mass extending across the cribriform plate. And these tumors arise from a neural crest derived cell that differentiates into olfactory sensory neurons. So on morphology, we see submucosal, sharply demarcated nests and lobules of tumor cells. However, as the tumor becomes goes into a high grade, we have more confluent growth patterns. Tumor cells are uniform and embedded in uh, fibrillary matrix or neuropil. They have round to over nuclei with stippled chromatin. And a very peculiar fibrovascular stroma is seen in these tumors, particularly the grade 1 and 2 tumors. And uh, here you can see they're almost glomeruloid vascular mass or vascular formations. Other tumor cells are round to ovoid. They may show streaming patterns in the fibrillary matrix. The nuclear pleomorphism ranges from mild to moderate to marked, depending on, and that would decide the grade of the tumor. Homerite rosettes are seen 
and low grade tumors whereas flex and intestinal rosettes with a lumen in the center are seen in higher grade tumors so the grading system that is used is Himes grade which uh, classifies tumors into grade 1 through to 4 and the, uh, as the grade increases there is a loss of lobular architecture increasing nuclear pleomorphism decrease in neurofibrillary matrix as I mentioned, homerite rosettes are in low-grade tumors, whereas plexner winter tumors uh, rosettes are in high-grade tumors. Mitotic activity necrosis are increasing as we go to higher grades, and calcification is present usually in the lower-grade tumors. On immunist chemistry, these tumors stain for neuroendocrine markers like chromogranin, synaptophysin, INSM1, which is a nuclear stain and very easy to interpret compared to cytoplasmic stains, also near, uh, NSE, GFAB are positive, and S100 stains the sustentacular cells. Rarely or factory neuroblastoma can be cytokeratin positive. And interestingly, NKX 2.2, which is a marker of waving sarcoma, has recently been found to be positive in a good proportion of all factory neuroblastomas. So we need to keep that in mind as it's a diagnostic pitfall. These tumors are mostly treated with surgical resection followed by radiotherapy with or without chemotherapy. And majority of the cases are uh, grade 3 and 4 and they're locally aggressive with intraorbital and intracranial extension. The clinical caddish stage shown here is predictive of survival outcome with decreasing 5-year survival as the uh, stage increases. Local recurrences are frequent in about 70%, cervical lymph node metastasis in 20 to 40%, and distant metastasis also do occur in 10% of cases. Next, we come to the case of a 48-year-old female. You can see here there's a tumor which appears like a small blue cell tumor which cells arrange in irregular infiltrating nests and cords of cells. On higher magnification, these tumor cells have very scant cytoplasm. The nuclei appear considerably pleomorphic and hyperchromatic. You can see here that there's a streaming appearance, the nuclear molding is appreciable and there are frequent mitotic figures. In other areas, necrosis was present and apoptosis was also frequent. Uh, on immunohistochemistry, this tumor was positive for chromogranin, synaptophysin, INSM1, and cytokeratin was also positive, indicating that this is a neuroendocrine carcinoma. And uh, it is also positive for TTF. So this is a small cell neuroendocrine carcinoma. And interestingly, as we've seen in other sites apart from lung, even cyanonasal tumors do show TTF1 positivity. Uh, KI67 labeling index was high as expected. Cyanonasal neuroendocrine carcinomas are high-grade carcinomas with morphological and immunophenotypic evidence of neuroendocrine dis differentiation accompanied by some degree of epithelial differentiation that is cytokeratin expression. These were uh, their uh, class in the head and neck. Uh, neuroendocrine carcinomas are classified as well, moderately, and poorly differentiated. And the former two are quite unusually encountered, whereas poorly differentiated are the ones which are seen more frequently among this group. And they are classified as small cell neuroendocrine carcinoma and large cell neuroendocrine carcinoma. They are most commonly located in the ethmoid sinus. Small cell neuroendocrine carcinoma is composed of nest cords and tuberculae of tumor cells and it may show solid architecture similar to the pulmonary counterpart. Rosettes may be seen, tumor cells are round, polygonal, ovoid or spindle with considerable pleomorphism. Large hyperchromatic nuclei which may also have stripper chromatin. Nuclear molding is frequent. Crushing, necrosis, mitosis and apoptosis are prominent. To differentiate from high-grade neuro, uh, olfactory, uh, olfactory neuroblastoma, neurofibrillary matrix is not seen in this tumor. And the staining for cytokeratin is punctate, which is similar again to olfactory neuroblastoma when it is seen there. It is positive chromo for chromogranin, synaptophysin, SM1, CD56. TTF1 is positive, however, it has also been reported in olfactory neuroblastomas. These tumors may be positive for P16, however, this is unrelated to HPV uh, association with HPV. Small cell neuroendocrine carcinomas are highly aggressive tumors with frequent local invasion into the orbit, skull, base, and brain, and uh, very short five-year overall survival periods, frequent local recurrence, and metastasis. This is a case that came on my table just yesterday where you can see metastasis to the bone marrow from a case of cyanonasal small cell carcinoma. 
Next, we have a case of a 35-year-old male who presented with a right cheek swelling, which uh, and on uh, radiology there was a mass on the right maxilla extending to the alveolar bone. Here you can see tumor cells are arranged in anastomosing tra trabeculae and lobules, and these tumor cells, again similar to the previous case, have quite scant cytoplasm, hyperchromatic nuclei. However, the nuclei look quite monomorphic as compared to the previous case. And although, although mitotic activity is frequent, the monomorphism of the tumor cells is quite striking. This tumor was positive for pancytokeratin, indicating it's a carcinoma as well as AMA. However, chromogranin and synaptophysin were negative. There was no evidence of squamous differentiation as P63 was negative. So this was classified as a sinonasal undifferentiated carcinoma, which is a carcinoma lacking specific squamous or glandular differentiation and is not otherwise classifiable. It's also uh, called SNUC and this is a rare tumor accounting for about 3-5% to of sinonasal carcinomas seen in adults with male preponderance again. It has, it usually presents with a rapid onset of symptoms and extensive disease at presentation. It arises in the nasal cavity and sinuses with and frequent bone destruction often extending to the orbit and the brain and advanced disease and seen in majority of the patients about 60 percent and no etiological features have been described as yet the cell of origin is not known and it may be related to both the schneiderian membrane as well as olfactory epithelium because it does show uh, some uh, uh, neuroendocrine di differentiation uh, as I uh, showed in the case, it consists of sheets, lobules, and trabeculae of overtly malignant cells, which could resemble a lymphoma, a carcinoma, and neuroendocrine carcinoma. They have poorly defined cell borders and varying amount of cytoplasm. Moderately large round nuclei, which vary from hyperchromatic to vesicular, with inconspicuous to prominent nuclei. However, these nuclei, as I said, are monotonous and lack nuclear pleomorphism, and they're of a relatively consistent size. However, apoptosis, mitosis, and necrosis are frequently seen in this tumor. Surface dysplasia is not seen. Immunohistochemistry, uh, they are positive for cytokeratin. They may show positivity for CK7, CK8, CK18, 19, which are all low molecular weight cytokeratins and EMA, but they are negative for high molecular weight keratins, that is CK5, 6, and CK14. They may be variably positive for P63, but P40, which is a more specific isoform and uh, more specific for squamous differentiation, is consistently negative. Uh, staining for neuroendocrine markers is usually absent. However, very focally, it may be present in some cases. It's negative for CEA, S100, LCA. Negative for NUT, INI expression is retained. So, P16 may be positive, as I said, regardless of HPV status. So, um, SNUC is basically a diagnosis of exclusion. After excluding olfactory neuroplastoma, neuroendocrine carcinoma, non-keratinizing squamous cell carcinoma, and a whole lot of other entities. Uh, so, it's possible that SNUC is actually becoming a wastebasket diagnosis right now. Uh, interestingly, recently IDH uh, R172 mutations have been identified in about 50 to 80 percent of SNUC which have been analyzed for this mutation, and this can be detected by IDH immunokist. Yeah, immunohistochemistry. So this suggests that maybe uh, there is a distinctive clinical pathological entity which is driven by activating IDH mutations and it also has prognostic and therapeutic significance. Some studies have shown that these tumors have better outcome however it has not been shown in other studies and more data is needed and IDH inhibitors are undergoing clinical trials for mandolymphoid malignancies which and the presence of these mutations might indicate that they have application in sinonasal tumors as well. So, it's possible that majority of SNAC are actually IDH mutant uh, sinonasal carcinomas and the rest are going to fall into some other categories with SNAC, as I said, becoming a wastebasket diagnosis. SNACs are highly aggressive neoplasm with poor survival and uh, the, they frequently have local recurrence and but nodal metastasis are uncommon. However, distant metastasis to bone, brain and liver do occur and are the major cause of morbidity and mortality. Next, we come to the case of a child, 10-year-old male with a maxillary sinus and nasal cavity mass. Here you can see the nasal mucosa along with fragments from a small round blue cell tumor. Here again, the cells look quite monomorphic with fairly uniform round nuclei. There appears to be some cyto uh, vacuolated cytoplasm, which is better appreciable here. There is some clear to paleosinophilic 
cytoplasm and with this monomorphic appearance distinct nuclear membranes fine chromatin the possibility of Ewing sarcoma is the first thing that comes to mind and uh, here you can see that the tumor cells are positive for MIG2 as well as NKX2.2 confirming the diagnosis. I think sarcoma is an undifferentiated round cell sarcoma which is defined by the presence of EWSR1 ETS family gene fusions. Tumor cells are arranged in sheets and vague lobules. They are fairly uniform small blue cells with round nuclei, scant clear or paleosinophilic cytoplasm and finely distributed chromatin. Necrosis and mitosis are frequent. Immunohistochemically, they show diffuse strong membranous positivity for MIG2 and NKX2.2, FLY1 and ARG show nuclear staining. There is variable staining with NSE, S100, synaptophysin, CD56, also cytokeratin and P63 in a small proportion of cases. The EWSR1 FLY1 translocation is most frequent and it can be identified by fish or real-time PCR. This is break apart fish where you can see that there is one fuse signal and two split red and green signals as well as here which indicates a rearrangement of the EWSR1 gene. And then like Ewing sarcomas have a much better outcome as compared to those of other sites. And the prognostic factors are the size, the stage and the response to neoadjuvant chemotherapy which determine the outcome of these patients. Uh, recently, uh, the subtype adamantinoma like Ewing sarcoma has been identified in various head and neck sites. This is an Ewing sarcoma subtype that demonstrates well-developed epithelial features in the form of uh, presence of squamous pearls, keratinization and intercellular bridges. Also, it shows the presence of basement membrane material as seen here. However, while these features might suggest the possibility of squamous cell carcinoma, the nuclei are strikingly isomorphic and do not show pleomorphism unlike squamous cell carcinoma. Again, on immunohistochemistry, while they are positive for squamous markers and cytokeratin, these tumors show diffuse MIG2 and NKX2.2 positivity, which would help to make the diagnosis. Case 7 is that of a 63-year-old female with recurrent episodes of epistaxis and a polypoid mass in the right nasal cavity arising from the middle turbinate. So here you can see the nasal turbinate which is identified by the presence of these patulous vessels which have an erectile appearance. And here you have a fragment of tumor tissue which appears quite blue as the cells might have quite scant cytoplasm. However, in other areas you can see the submucosal tumor is a little pink appearing because the cells have some more cytoplasm than in the previous area. And at places a perithelomatous pattern is appreciable where the tumor cells are seen adherent to blood vessels whereas there is a dropout of tumor cells in the intervening area with some necrosis. And this pattern is quite characteristic of this diagnosis. Uh, majority of the tumor cells in these, uh, in the initial areas that I showed you had hyperchromatic nuclei. Only occasional cells show the presence of nucleoli and they have some amount of cytoplasm. Whereas in other areas you can see that they have larger vesicular nuclei and very prominent eosinophilic nucleoli. So with these features, we are thinking of a melanoma. You know that majority of mucosal melanomas are amelanotic. But yeah, we did search for pigment and didn't find any. On immunohistochemistry, we did the whole panel and it was negative for cytokeratin. And uh, LCA, S100 showed focal positivity. Interestingly, you can see that synaptophysin is positive as is chromogranin. But HMB45, Milan A and SOX10 were all positive And this was a synonasal mucosal melanoma. So approximately 55% of all mucosal melanomas arise in the head and neck, with cyanonasal tract being the most frequent site in the head and neck region. These are uh, seen in older patients in the seven decade of life. Slight female preponderance has been described and they originate from intramucosal melanocytes, which are frequently present in the nasal septum and the turbinates. Uh, these tumors have discohesive cells with perithelomatous growth patterns. The cells are either epithelioid or spindle shaped. They may have eccentric nuclei and variably prominent nucleoli. Intranuclear cytoplasmic inclusions may be present. Mitosis and necrosis are frequent and melanin pigment is rarely seen. About up to 70% of head and neck melanomas are amelanotic regardless of the cell morphology. And accompanied by S100 negativity and focal staining, this can make diagnosis very difficult. Uh, so we use not just one marker, but 
um, uh, at least uh, three to four markers do we have to identify these tumors and SOX10 is a nuclear stain which is very easy to identify whereas HMB45, Melanie, S100 show more focal staining while SOX10 is more diffusely positive. Uh, interestingly, melanomas are known to show aberrant immunistic chemical staining, which is a pitfall in diagnosis. Cytokeratin can be positive in 10%, cyanotrophycin is reported in 13%, but chromoglanin is less often. And MIG2 can be positive in about 25% of cases. So this is why when you're looking at an undifferentiated round blue cell tumor in the cyanonasal tract, sometimes it's best to, you know, uh, put one marker for each of the lineages that you're thinking about instead of, you know, going one step at a time and say just doing first a CK and then then going in for the next panel because uh, there is a lot of overlapping immunopositivity in these tumors as well and that can cause a lot of confusion. So you need a high index of suspicion, awareness of divergent differentiation and aberrant immunohistochemical staining patterns to avoid potential misinterpretation of melanomas. Electron microscopy can be very useful in resolving the differential diagnosis when there are overlapping immunohistochemical features. And in this case, we performed electron microscopy and here you can see this is a, a melanosome. These are some pictures from the internet which are going, uh, which show the different stages of pre-melanosomes. So stage 1 are sp spherical without my, many filaments within them. Stage 2 are ellipsoidal and they have a lattice-like appearance of the filaments within them. In stage 3, the matrix starts to get melanized. You can see it's appearing black here. And in stage 4, there is complete melanization of the melanosome. Coming to case 8, again a child, 4-year-old female with a cyanonasal mass. Here you can see this is a nice polypoidal tumor. And you can see a distinct condensation of tumor cells just below the epithelium. That's what you're seeing here. And on higher magnification, some of these cells have very scant cytoplasm and hyperchromatic nuclei, whereas others appear to have more um, less hyperchromatic nuclei and some amount of eosinophilic cytoplasm. On higher magnification, you can see the same thing. These are some cells which are showing more abundant eosinophilic cytoplasm. There are some spindle-shaped cells as well, while others are just small round cells. So when we see a tumor in a child with tumor cells which are varying from round to spindle to polygonal, they have some eosinophilic cytoplasm and are embedded in a loose myxoid to collagenous matrix. You think of a rhabdomyosarcoma and here this is positive for Desmond diffusely and you, it highlights the nice cambium layer that we were seeing. And these are also positive for myogen in about half of the tumor cells. This is an embryonal rhabdomyosarcoma. Rhabdomyosarcomas are malignant mesenchymal tumors with myogenic differentiation. They are the most frequent head and neck sarcomas both in adults as well as pediatric patients. In children, embryonal RMS is the most common, followed by pleomorphic and spindle cell. Whereas in young adults, and, uh, in young adults alveolar RMS is more common. These frequently present as a polypoid nasal mass. Embryonal RMS shows uh, primitive tumor cells which are in various stages of rhabdomyoblastic differentiation. Now, rhabdomyoblasts have eos bright eosinophilic cytoplasm, which is why we see uh, a, a whole range of maturation of these tumor cells in these tumors. They have scant to abundant eosinophilic cytoplasm and they vary from round to spindle shaped nuclei and the, the stroma is variably mixoid to collagenous and a variable number of rhabdomyoblasts with this bright eosinophilic cytoplasm are present. I showed you the cambium layer that is seen in the botryoid type. It is a subepithelial condensation of tumor cells and it usually presents as a polypoid mass. Alveolar RMS is seen more commonly in adults. Uh, second and third decades of life. These are small round tumor cells with scanned cytoplasm and hyperchromatic nuclei. This was the one which resembles more of a small round blue cell tumor and the alveolar pattern results from discohesion of cells at the center of the nest with the cells being adherent to fibrocollagenous septae at the periphery and giving a dilapidated appearance. Tumor giant cells are frequently seen. Uh, 
Both of these subtypes can show the presence of fast positive cytoplasmic glycogen similar to Ewing sarcoma. And on immunohistochemistry, they are positive for Desmin, Myogenin, and MyoD1. Embryonal uh, rhabdomyosarcoma show more of Desmin positivity, and Myogenin is less frequent as it is a more primitive marker, whereas alveolar RMS are more primitive tumors and show more of Myogenin positivity. Again, we can have aberrant immunoexpression of cytokeratin and synaptofysin in these tumors. Uh, the PAX3 or PAX7 FOXO1 re gene rearrangement is seen in alveolar rhabdomyosarcomas and it's associated with a poor outcome. And uh, currently, pediatric oncologists recommend that all rhabdomyosarcomas, irrespective of the histology, whether embryonal or, or alveolar, should be tested for this rearrangement as it has an independent impact on the outcome of the patient. These tumors are treated with chemotherapy, so we usually don't see excision specimens, just small biopsies. However, on occasion, debulking surgery may be done and we may get a CS specimen. Uh, as I mentioned, alveolar RMS and also sp spindle cell sclerosing RMS with the myoD1 mutation have a worse prognosis as compared to embryonal rhabdomyosarcoma. Next is a 20-year male with a nasal mass and a palatal ulcer. Here you can see the palatal mucosa with an underlying dense infiltrate of blue appearing cells. On higher magnification, you can see that these are intermediate sized cells with scant to moderate cytoplasm and they have areas of necrosis and a striking pattern of angiocentricity. And immunohistochemically, they are positive for focally for CD3 and CD56. EBV LMP1 shows punctate granular staining in few of the cells and this is granzyme B which is positive. Again, you can see the angiocentric pattern is highlighted here. This was a case of extranodal NKT cell lymphoma, nasal type, which is an aggressive non-Hodgkin lymphoma of NK or T cell lineage characterized by angiocentric growth pattern, angiodestruction and coagulative necrosis and has a universal association with Epstein-Barr virus. The most common site of this tumor is in the upper aerodigestive tract and it is the most common sinonasal lymphoma that you would encounter. They usually present with distinctive destructive midfacial lesions involving the nasal cavity with destruction of the septum, ulceration of the palate and extension to the orbit causing proptosis. Histologically, we see a polymorphic infiltrate of small, medium or large size cells with pale eosinophilic to clear cytoplasm, irregularly folded or indented nuclei with granular chromatin and variably prominent nucleoli. There's an admixture of inflammatory cells including lymphocytes, histiocytes and plasma cells. Pseudoepithelium matters hyperplasia may be present on the surface. Biopsies frequently so show extensive necrosis and scanned viable cells with poorly preserved morphology and crushing making diagnosis difficult. But the angiocentric pattern when, when identified helps you to clinch the diagnosis and apply the appropriate immunohistochemical panel. P63 may be positive in this uh, neoplasm as in other T-cell lymphomas. So we need to keep that in mind. And bulky disease, extensive local infiltration are associated with poor outcome in these patients. Mm. Case 10 is that of a 55-year-old female who presented with headache and a nasal mass. So we can see intact nasal mucosa with a subepithelial tumor arranged in uh, trabeculae and solid sheaths. And these tumor cells are fairly uniform, polygonal in shape. As you can see here, they have finely granular eosinophilic cytoplasm and well-defined cytoplasmic borders. And very fine powdery chromatin. So these features make you think of a neuroendocrine carcinoma well differentiated but when you see something that looks like a well differentiated neuroendocrine carcinoma in the nasal cavity your first thought should be that is this a pituitary adenoma and pituitary adenomas can occur in the sinonasal region by direct extension from a cellar tumor or they may be ectopically located in the sinonasal tract and particularly in the sphenoid sinus. They occur in a wide age range and are more common in females. Immunohistochemically, while they are positive for cytokeratin, chromogranin, and synaptophysin, just like any other neuroendocrine tumor, well, when you see this morphology, you should always suspect pituitary adenoma and perform the pituitary immunohistochemistry for pituitary hormones and transcription factors. And our case was immunopositive for ACTH. So always suspect pituitary adenoma when you encounter a well differentiated neuroendocrine tumor in the sinonasal tract. So with that, we come to the end of uh, 
Mr. Sleep, I hope that you haven't gone to sleep because the next few unicorns coming up are going to drive you nuts. So yeah, next case, case 11, is that of a 25 year old male who presented with right facial fullness, loose teeth for 4 months and the imaging showed a maxillary sinus lesion extending to the heart palate and there was evidence of lymph node metastasis on the PET CT. So what you see here are sheets and irregularly connected trabeculae of what again appears to be a basaloid looking tumor. And here you see the tumor cells predominantly have scanned cytoplasm, whereas some of the tumor cells have a little more abundant clear cytoplasm. A few of the tumor cells are showing these empty vacuoles. So when we see cells with clear cytoplasm, they do have some wispy strands within them which are visible. But these empty or non-specific vacuoles are completely clear. They're empty. And here you can see that most of the tumor cells have vesicular bland appearing nuclei, uh, whereas a few of them do have prominent nucleoli. And there are a few interspersed neutrophils within the tumor cells. On immunohistochemistry, the tumor is positive for cytokeratin, indicating it's a carcinoma. B40 was diffusely positive as well. However, we also performed immune histochemistry for INI1 because we saw the empty vacuoles. And this tumor shows loss of INI1 staining. The internal control is seen in the endothelial cells. Excuse me. <coughs> Excuse me. We have another case of a 20-year-old male who presented with a right cheek swelling for two years and on imaging there was a mass in the maxillary sinus and nasal cavity. This again is composed of sheets of tumor cells but this appears more pink as compared to the previous blue looking tumor and this is causing bone destruction. <coughs> Excuse me. Tumor cells are ovoid as well as polygonal cells are present. They have abundant pink cytoplasm. You can see frequent mitotic activity within the tumor cells. And a few cells do show eccentrically placed nuclei with bright inclusion like uh, cytoplasm. Again, we have these empty vacuoles in this tumor as well. A lot of neutrophils again infiltrating the tumor cells. So again, some more images highlighting eccentrically placed nuclei, abundant pink cytoplasm which is almost inclusion-like in some of these cells. Frequent mitosis, a lot of neutrophils within the tumor cells. Uh, another high power, so these are definitely rhabdoid appearing uh, with an eccentric vesicular nucleus, prominent nucleolus, and abundant pink cytoplasm. This tumor is again positive for cytokeratin. However, P40, unlike the previous tumor, is negative. This is a nice internal control in the overlying epithelium. Focal positivity for chromogranin and synaptophysin is, uh, and for chromogranin is present. However, synaptophysin and CD56 is negative. Again, the tumor cells show loss of INI1 and it is retained in the surrounding endothelial cells and inflammatory cells. So, SMARC B1 or INI1 deficient cyanonasal carcinoma was recently described in 2014 and it has been included in the WHO classification of 2017 as a provisional entity under SNUC. It is characterized by morphological evidence of rhabdoid differentiation which is variably present but more importantly the driver genetic event which is inactivating alterations in the SMARC B1 gene which encodes the INI1 protein which is also known to be inactivated in a number of other tumors. And this can be demonstrated by loss of immune expression per INI1. <coughs> These tumors account for about 27 to 7% of primary cyanonasal carcinomas in the published studies till date. They occur over a wide age range and they are more frequent in males. The nasal cavity and ethmoid sinus are most commonly involved, but all the other sinuses have been reported to be have, have this tumor. And most frequently, multiple sinonasal sites are involved by the tumor, which usually presents at advanced stage with bone destruction and periorbital tissue infiltration. Most of these cases had previously been diagnosed as non keratinizing squamous cell carcinoma or as SNUC before they were identified as SMARC B1 deficient carcinomas. So the, the morphology that has been described for this tu these tumors is basaloid or blue appearing tumors which resemble basaloid squamous cell carcinoma in majority of cases, about 
and they show peripheral palisading inverted papilloma like growth and peritoneal spread along respiratory epithelium clefting artifact around humor islands interspersed isolated rhabdoid appearing cells may or may not be seen in the basaloid appearing tumors and these clear empty cytoplasmic vacuoles which i mentioned earlier are a clue which might help you to uh, to think of this diagnosis in a undifferentiated basaloid appearing carcinoma then you have in about 40% of cases it has been reported that there are plasma cytoid or pink appearing tumors where you have plasma cytoid cells and few rhabdoid cells so plasma cytoid cells have abundant pale pink pink cytoplasm and eccentric nucleus and rhabdoid have a bright pink globule or inclusion like cytoplasm which is seen here so this is about less than half of the cases are plasma cytoid in appearance and recently we found that there's another morphological pattern that is of oncocytic cells which are seen in glandular patterns also which are uh, which show ini loss and these are ck positive and were previously reported as adenocarcinomas so when we encounter new entities it takes a time uh, a while for us to identify all the different morphological patterns that they might show and as uh, we gain more knowledge we learn more about these tumors so until we actually see the entire morphological spectrum it is prudent to you know use ini1 immunohistochemistry chemistry in any undifferentiated looking tumor or any tumor which does not show classical morphological features of a known entity so uh, smart b1 copy number alterations and deletions can be identified by uh, fluorescence in situ hybridization however ini1 immunohistochemistry chemistry is a more sensitive method for detection of these tumors because fish cannot detect small intergenic deletions when do we think of smart b1 deficient carcinoma any basaloid appearing cytonasal neoplasm which shows few interspersed plasma cytoid rhabdoid and clear cells when you have focal staining with squamous markers in the absence of overt squamous differentiation when you have focal staining for neuroendocrine markers in the absence of morphological features of neuroendocrine differentiation like nested growth rosette formation or stipple chromatin when you have negative staining for myopithelial markers despite a plasma cytoid appearance and uh, knowledge of this entity is really important to prompt ini1 immunohistochemistry chemistry in all poorly differentiated neoplasms with unusual morphology not just in those which classically appear basaloid and rhabdoid and as i mentioned in basaloid tumors these empty vacuoles are what are going to help you this is what i have found has helped me on more than one occasion and of course when you have what are plasma cytoid rhabdoid appearing cells in abundance that's going to help you again these tumors are aggressive with uniformly poor prognosis and they present as large locally advanced destructive masses because of their rarity there's no defined management protocol protocols as yet but most have undergone surgery followed by chemo radiation but they still have local recurrences and distant metastases showing that they have a very aggressive clinical course and the mortality rate reported is around 50% so far which is why it's very important that we identify these tumors Next is case 13 a 10 year old girl with a fire fiber mass filling the nasal cavity and extending to the lacrimal fossa she had undergone a biopsy on two different occasions and once it was called basal cell carcinoma and once inverted papilloma so this is the biopsy that we received and you can see there are sheets of undifferentiated basaloid appearing cells some clear cytoplasm at places a lot of inflammatory cells here abundant necrosis is present and on higher magnification you can see some peripheral palisading some clearing of the cytoplasm and prominent inflammatory infiltrate so on higher magnification these clear cells are basically abrupt squamous cell differentiation in the form of immature appearing squamous cells which are surrounded by basaloid cells and this morphology of abrupt squamous differentiation is quite typical of this entity uh p40 was diffusely immunopositive and here these tumor cells are nicely positive for nut nut carcinoma is another recently described genetically defined neoplasm which has been reported in midline structures like the head and neck mediastinum and it is considered a subtype of squamous cell carcinoma as there is histological evidence of abrupt squamous differentiation as well as expression of uh, markers of squamous cells like p53 p63 and p40 and it is defined by rearrangement of the nut m1 or nucleoprotein intestines gene 
The most frequent fusion partners of this uh, gene are BRD4 and BRD3, which is uh, account for about 75% of the fusions, which can be detected by fish, real-time PCR, and targeted NGS. However, nut immunohistochemistry is a fairly reliable surrogate because this protein is normally only expressed in testes and not in any other tissues. So, it positivity is quite specific for this diagnosis. The prognosis of this tumor, again, is uniformly poor with frequent lymph node metastasis as well as hematogenous metastasis. Overall survival rates at 1 and 2 years have been as low as 30 and 19% and median overall survival time reported has been around 6 months. So these have a short clinical history and a rapidly progressive tumor mass. And so we want to identify these tumors for sure. And so we perform nut immunohistochemistry in all cases of poorly differentiated carcinomas with abrupt squamous differentiation, irrespective of the patient's age, and particularly in midline structures and unusual tumor locations. Uh, case 14 is the last case, and this is a 70-year-old male with a sinonasal mass. You can see the tumor cells are fairly uniform, arranged in a trabecular pattern with fibrocollagen septi. And on higher magnification, they are fairly uniform appearing nuclei, some pale eosinophilic to clear cytoplasm. And the chromatin appears stippled in some of the cells, whereas in others you have what appears to be uh, conspicuous to prominent nucleoli. With these features, you would think of a neuroendocrine carcinoma as one of the possibilities, uh, apart from, uh, I mean, all the other uh, usual suspects, I think I would put neuroendocrine carcinoma on the top. And we performed the immunohistochemical panel, and it is diffusely positive for cytokeratin. However, cyanaprofacin and chromogranin are just showing some punctate positivity in very few of the tumor cells, not diffuse positivity like you would expect. And this is INSM1, where you can see very few of the tumor cells are actually stained. And this is the maximum staining that we got in the whole tumor. And this is uh, INI1, which is retained in the tumor cells, as well as the overlying epithelium. So this is not an INI deficient carcinoma. This is the KI67 labeling index, which is very high. Uh, so lastly, the, we perform uh, BRG1 immunohistochemistry or SMARC A4, and this is showing loss of expression in the tumor cells. So this is the most recently defined uh, entity, which is SMARC A4 or BRG1 deficient carcinoma. Uh, recently, SMARC A4 loss was documented in a number of poorly differentiated or undifferentiated sinonasal tumors, including poorly differentiated neuroendocrine carcinomas, sinonasal undifferentiated carcinoma, teratocarcinosarcoma, and also a case of olfactory neuroblastoma. So this suggests that is this a distinct entity of SMARC, B4, uh, SMARC A4 or BRG1 deficient carcinoma, so which has a heterogeneous uh, histological uh, profile but is unified by loss of BRG1 staining. These tumors all stain diffusely with cytokeratin and very focally or weakly and weakly with immunohistochemical markers like chromogranin and synaptophysin and INSM1 is almost always negative or only stains occasional cells. Majority of the reported cases have demonstrated aggressive clinical behavior which is again why you want to pick these up. And so SMARC A4, I, uh, SMARC A4 or BRG1 IHC should be applied along with any neuroendocrine markers in an initial panel for sinonasal tumors which show neuroendocrine-like morphology, either small cell or large cell. So to summarize, sinonasal undifferentiated neoplasms are a wide spectrum. They include undifferentiated carcinomas, sarcomas, neuroectodermal tumors, lymphomas. And this is an algorithmic approach which has been given by Abbas Aghemi recently, where you first determine if the tumor looks like a carcinoma. Is it positive for cytokeratin? If yes, then you go ahead with squamous markers. If present, then your differentials are poorly differentiated squamous cell carcinoma. If EBV is positive, it's a lymphoepithelial carcinoma. If nut is positive, it's a nut carcinoma. If the INI1 is lost, then you go for a smart B1 deficient carcinoma. We can add BRG1 here and say that smart B, uh, smart K4 deficient carcinoma if there is loss of BRG1. Uh, whereas if the squamous markers are negative, then your options are SNUC. If SNUC, is there an IDH mutation? You can perform IDH immunohistochemistry to determine that. Or 
then you have poorly differentiated adenocarcinomas which you work up further with CK7 and CK20 to identify whether ITAC or NITAC neuroendocrine carcinomas where you use chromogran and synaptophysin to confirm neuroendocrine lineage and also INSM1 uh, here we have smart K4 deficient carcinoma and INI loss which can be in both P40 positive as well as negative tumors uh, for the CK negative tumors your options are Ewing sarcoma, alveolar and embryonal abdominal sarcoma, synovial sarcoma as well in CK positive negative tumors and uh, then you have olfactory neuroblastoma, melanoma and lymphoma so you can apply the appropriate immunist chemical markers for these tumors. So to conclude, cyanonasal neoplasms uh, they encompass a wide range of histological types most of them are malignant and highly invasive destructive tumors causing a lot of morbidity and mortality and uh, this is why the knowledge of newer entities is uh, necessary along with the high index of suspicion to avoid misdiagnosis and to institute appropriate management and prognostication. Many of them now harbor specific genetic alterations and present opportunities for molecular diagnosis, prognostication and thera uh, targeted therapeutics. But histopathological features and immunohistochemistry do remain the cornerstone of diagnosis on a daily basis and an algorithmic approach may be helpful in reaching the final diagnosis in majority of these tumors. Thank you. Thank you. Wonderful. So nicely done. Excellent presentation, Dr. Kakur. Fantastically done. Wow. If you can just stop presenting and yeah, you can see on your chat the questions and the comments. Can you? Yes, I can. Okay. So okay, there's you, quite a few comments to go through. If here. you want, you can go with the comments first. That'll give you some elevation. Okay, so this question is something which I recently discussed in the department as well. How do you differentiate Heinz grade three and four olfactory neuroblastoma from uh, poorly differentiated neuroendocrine carcinoma? It is actually, in my opinion, it is very, very difficult to differentiate between these two. Calretinin has been uh, proposed to be positive in olfactory neuroblastomas, but it's also been reported in uh, neuroendocrine carcinomas. TTF1 is positive in neuroendocrine carcinomas, especially the small cell type. Not all of them, but at least half of them. But it has also been shown to be positive in olfactory neuroblastomas. And uh, I think the features which actually do help is uh, the presence of abundant apoptosis, the presence of nuclear molding, and a lot of crushing. These are the things which would uh, you know, move my diagnosis towards a, large cell, towards a poorly differentiated neuroendocrine carcinoma from uh, an olfactory neuroblastoma. Also, olfactory neuroblastoma, the high-grade tumors also, they you expect that they would show some uh, lobular uh, architecture in some part of them. If you see that lobular architecture and that characteristic fibrovascular stroma, that should take you towards olfactory neuroblastoma. Okay, another question is, in any sinonasal round cell tumor, do myogenin first to rule out alveolar RMS because... IRMS has very promiscuous IHC. Yes, definitely. So we have had, I have seen cases which were reported as olfactory neuroblastoma and turned out to be rhabdomyosarcoma, but because the initial panel only included neuroendocrine markers and not myogenic markers. So yes, you see the age of the patient, you see the, if it's a pure down cell morphology, you do want to include desmond myogenin to exclude an rhabdomyosarcoma because it is always going to come in your differential. So while some people do say that an algorithmic approach is better, I feel that uh, in your first panel itself, you want to include all the lineages that you're possibly thinking of. It does become a little extensive at times, but you don't want to miss out on something because of this overlapping immunohistochemical profile that a lot of tumors in this region do show. Um, thank you, Sandeep, sir, for your comment. Thanks. Thanks, Deepika. Okay. Thanks everyone for your comments. I think there aren't any more questions. Yeah, there aren't many questions, but there are quite a few very nice comments. Yes. And uh, I think I need to read them for you. <laughs> well, let's go with Dr. Shivani Gupta. Thanks a lot, ma'am, for an amazing presentation with absolutely stunning cases. 
Thank you. Right, Dr. Aruna says wonderful presentation. Dr. Manoj Kahar, a comprehensive compilation of all entities of Sino nasal region. Excellent lecture with very useful tips. Yeah, I agree. On newer entities, thanks a lot, Dr. Madam. Yeah, great. Thank Excellent you. and comprehensive. That is Kanvit Kaur, I think your colleague. Yes. Excellent and comprehensive collection of cases with beautiful photo micrograph. And you have read Dr. Deepika Mishra's and Dr. Sandeep Mathur's comment yourself, right? And Ruchi says, well done. Yeah, thank you, everyone. And then you have Dr. Janvi saying, thanks, ma'am. Anyway, let me conclude here. Dr. Archil, wonderful to have you here. It was a pleasure listening to you. A very nice presentation and very crystal clear. It shows how clear is your concept of head and neck regions and this particularly sinonasal tumor. We'll surely be having you again, I think, after two weeks. Yes, that's right. Yeah, so we'll be looking forward to that. Thank you for taking our time from such a busy schedule of yours. Thank you so much. Please share the PDF so that we can share with so many other people who would be there to learn from there. Right? You can send it either on the mail or you can send it on the WhatsApp. Sure. Whichever way is convenient to you. Thank you so much. Thank you, everybody, for joining in. Thank you. Good night. Take care. Bye-bye. God bless you.